Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Wood, and I'm the executive director of the Raymond A. Wood Foundation. Thank you for joining us tonight for our April monthly um, webinar on growth hormone and getting your growth hormone question, replacement questions answered. We're honored to have Dr. Laurie Cohen here with us. And Dr. Cohen is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes at the Children's Hospital of Montefiore. Did I get that right? Montefiore, yeah. <laughs> Great, in Bronx, New York. Dr. Cohen received her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and her medical degree from the Cornell University Medical College. She did her internship and residency training in pediatrics at Yale New Haven Hospital and her fellowship training in pediatric endocrinology at Boston Children's Hospital. She remained on staff at Boston Children's where among other roles, she was director of the neuroendocrinology program for 20 years. Dr. Cohen specializes in endocrine issues experienced by childhood cancer survivors. She is also an expert in growth disorders and short stature in children. Throughout her career, Dr. Cohen has been involved with research examining the impact of cancer therapies on patients with hematologic and central nervous system tumors, as well as examining determinants of growth and development. She has worked on prospective papers and consensus guidelines in these areas for the Children's Oncology Group, Pediatric Endocrine Society, Endocrine Society Growth Hormone Research Society, and International Guideline Harmonization Group. She is also on the board of directors for the Pediatric Endocrine Society. So thank you, Dr. Cohen, for joining us. And just to let everyone know how this is going to go, uh, Dr. Cohen will be presenting and then taking questions um, at the end. So please do post your questions in the chat section or in the QA feature um, in the bottom, typically in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Cohen. Hi, well, thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, and I thought we'd start, if we can get the poll up and going, just with three questions for me to get to know all of you um, and to see if I'm answering everything. So the first question was, if you, your child, has growth hormone deficiency, was it diagnosed before or after the brain tumor was diagnosed? It looks like, I'll give it one more minute. We're close to 100%. Okay. So it looks like the majority were after, and that's what I would expect, but I am gonna spend some time explaining why it may develop beforehand so people are clear as to why that may have happened. Okay, do we have the next question? If you, your child has growth hormone deficiency, are you receiving growth hormone deficient treatment or are they receiving it? So it looks like about two thirds are receiving it and about one third aren't. Okay, and then the next question. If you, your child is on growth hormone treatment, when was it started after brain tumor treatment ended? Immediately, three months, six months, nine months, a year or longer, and you can round. And we can see here that there's a lot of variation. We have some starting very early and actually about a fifth. And we'll come back and talk about that because that's sort of newer. We have some who are taking longer than a year to be treated. Okay. I think we can end the poll. And I, hold on one sec. Okay. We end the poll? Yes, it's down. It's closed. Okay, that's still on my screen. Hmm, okay. There we go, okay. So today I thought I'd talk a little bit about the etiology of growth hormone deficiency because I think for those of you whose, whose children are you presented with growth hormone deficiency, it's sort of nice to know why that happened. And that goes a little bit into pituitary development and a little bit, and obviously tumor location is a big part there. But 
most of it, I'm sure you want to know about the safety of recombinant human growth hormone therapy and sort of what are the risks versus benefits. And there were a bunch of questions that were actually posed by the audience ahead of time. And I thought I'd put them down here just as a, sort of an idea of some of the things that were being asked. And obviously we're gonna to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, but I thought these were interesting because there are things that we need to talk about this evening. So the first is, was, is it damaging in any way to the survivors if growth hormone was never given? What possible effects could this have on overall survival in years ahead? Second was in children under 10, how long status post resection of tumors is it recommended to start? I've read one to two years of standard practice, but also that there isn't evidence to support waiting. What does the current research recommend? And then what about treatment? Do kids on growth hormone ever have growth spurts? How is that handled or accomplished? So just to start, I wanna remind you that what we're really talking about here is the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And you have two parts to that, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The hypothalamus controls the hormone system. That's what we're talking about tonight. But as you are well aware, it also controls appetite. It regulates sleep and it regulates body temperature among other things. The pituitary is sometimes called the master gland and it controls all the other hormone glands. And this is just this example. And, and something to recognize is that the two parts of the pituitary are very different. So you have the anterior part and the anterior part gets it's sort of fed from blood vessels. You have releasing hormones from the hypothalamus that travel down these blood connections into the pituitary, and then the pituitary produces and secretes its hormones. And tonight we're talking about growth hormone, but it also secretes thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropin, which stimulates the adrenal glands, um, the gonadotropins, FSH and LH, which are gonna stimulate the ovary and testes, and prolactin, which stimulates the mammary glands for milk production. The posterior part of the back part is more of a storage bin. It takes hormones that are made in the hypothalamus, so vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone, the one that helps you hold on to water, and oxytocin, which is important um, both for the mammary glands and for um, uterine contractions during um, childbirth, but also you're hearing a lot more about it as sort of the feel-good hormone and even whether it's involved in appetite regulation. But anyway, it takes those hormones up here and they travel down nerve connections and then they're just secreted out of the posterior pituitary. And so you can get pituitary hormone deficiencies, which is known as hypopituitarism, because the tumors there, or for what it looks like a lot of the audience, the surgeons did some damage, unavoidable damage when they had to remove the tumor. And you can also get it from radiation. Now, why does this even happen? And I know a lot of the um, members of the audience, either the patients um, themselves there or parents of, of children who had um, craniopharyngiomas. And they're actually really sort of interesting how they develop because they're not malignant brain tumors. They're actually benign tissue that's sort of in the wrong place. And it all happens because the front part of your pituitary forms from this single cell thick layer of tissue that's the same as the tissue in your throat. And it's meeting tissue from that, that area of the brain where the hypothalamus is developing, that's neural tissue. And that pituitary tissue, it sort of pinches up and then pinches together and pinches off and migrates up. And it migrates up through this hypoph hypophysial duct or craniopharyngeal canal. So keep that in canal in, in mind. And then ultimately this mature gland has this part, this anterior part, that's that throat tissue and that this posterior part that's more like brain tissue. And so they're two very different things that just come together. So craniopharyngiomas arise from neoplastic transformation, which just means a change in the cells from remnants of that hypophysial duct. And so they can really develop anywhere along that migration path. But when you look at them under a microscope, they're actually benign. And then the other thing to keep in mind, and I thought sometimes you guys may have seen these MRIs up and they show you that big tumor in there, but what does it things look like normally? And I just, I like the picture when you're looking in the side. When you're looking at the side, you see this little pituitary in here that's the size of a pea or so, and this anterior front and this 
posterior part that's very bright is bright because of the vasopressin. And here's this stalk that's just connecting upwards. And this is where the eyes, the eye nerves cross, the optic chiasm. And that's why many of the kids will have trouble present with poor vision. Um, whoops. Because this tumor is involved in here and uh, here's the hypothalamus. And then these darker areas are ventricles where the cerebral spinal fluid is flowing. And this is your third ventricle. And I bring this all up because the presentation is really related to the location. So when you have craniopharyngiomas that are within this cella tercicola or the saddle where it sits, or they're below that third ventricular floor, 80% of them will present with pituitary hormone deficiencies, but won't necessarily have hypothalamic involvement. When they develop above that third ventricular floor, the base of the third ventricle, and when they're really in the ventricles themselves, only about a fifth of them have pituitary hormone deficiencies, but about three quarters of them have hypothalamic dysfunction. So how somebody even presents before the surgeons go in really depends on the location. And then you can imagine, depending on where the tumor is, that's going to make a difference as what the surgeons take out or don't take out. And just to give you an idea of this, this is, would be an example of somebody who's this, this craniopharyngioma here is really wiping out the pituitary, but up here, this whole hypothalamic area is just intact. You can see the eye nerves are there. Whereas here, this is a normal pituitary, just a little squished, but here you have this whole big tumor that's now obliterating the hypothalamus. And that's really gonna make the difference is how the kids prevent, present, whether they present with um, decreased vision because of the optic chiasm, bad headaches because they're obstructing the ventricles, and so you're increasing the pressure on the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. And then other brain tumors can develop pituitary hormone deficiencies because they receive radiation. So just in case there's somebody else who's sitting in the audience who has questions about growth hormone, but they don't have craniopharyngiomas, it's commonly in that case, if it's not a pituitary tumor like the craniopharyngioma or pituitary adenomas, but another kind of brain tumor, they've received radiation. And then growth hormones generally the first hormone to be affected and the risk increases with the dose of radiation and the time from radiation. Okay, so why do we care about growth hormone deficiency? Growth hormone was named because it was discovered that it causes people to grow. So when you're growth hormone deficient, you usually have poor growth. And that's obviously of concern when you have the younger the child is because the longer the period of time they have to grow and you don't want somebody to end up super short. But there can be growth without growth hormone. That means some of the kids out there who are growth hormone deficient are gonna grow normally, even if they're not making growth hormone and they don't receive growth hormone. And that has been commonly described in patients who've had craniopharyngiomas who have the hypothalamic obesity, but it's also been described in kids with idiopathic congenital growth hormone deficiency. But growth hormone isn't just important for growth. It's also important for lots of, um, for metabolism and lots of other things in the body. And so people with growth hormone deficiency tend to have an increased fat mass. They tend to have decreased lean mass, sometimes um, just less musculature, feeling weaker, decreased bone mineral density, among other things. So when you're giving somebody growth hormone, you're not just worried about how tall they're gonna get. And that becomes important when we start talking about adults who have growth hormone deficiency, because clearly we're not giving them growth hormone to make them grow taller, but we're giving growth hormone for the metabolic effects. Okay. So we can give growth hormone and not, Classically, we've given growth hormone by injections right under the skin, subcutaneous injections. And when growth hormone was first um, identified and started being used, it was given three times a week. It wasn't very plentiful. And as it became more plentiful, as they were able to make it um, by recombinant techniques, it went to be more physiologic and six to seven times a week. And um, I think one of the questions that will come up and we'll talk a bit a little later is, what do you do now that um, there's been a long acting growth hormone approved? But I'd like to come back to that later. So 
I think it's always important when you talk, when you're thinking about safety issues, to not just talk about concerns with a tumor or craniopharyngioma, what's going to do that, but just what are the general safety issues? Because all medications have some side effects. For example, if you take an antihistamine, you might get sleepy. So there are a number of known side effects of growth hormone therapy, and fortunately, they're fairly rare. For example, benign intracranial hypertension, otherwise known as pseudotumor cerebri. It's a buildup of pressure in the brain, but it only happens in 28 per 100,000 treatment years. Now, this might be difficult to distinguish in a patient who's had a craniopharyngioma where we're worried about pressure buildup because the um, tumor may be obstructing, the craniopharyngioma may be obstructing the ventricles. But we take any serious headache, and sorry, we take any headache seriously. We also know that it can cause slip capital femoral epiphysis. That's when the head or the ball part of the top of the femur, which is the thigh bone, slips out of joint. It occurs 73 per 100,000 treatment years. So again, very rare. And there are many other risk factors for, this is known as skiffy for short. <clears throat> it includes obesity. So clearly, if we're worried about hypothalamic obesity, that would be a risk factor. Hypothyroidism, and it's usually sort of a profound untreated hypothyroidism. Genetics, steroids, not maintenance doses of glucocorticoids, but high doses. Radiation, chemotherapy, and bone problems related to kidney disease. People always ask about scoliosis progression. So scoliosis is curvature of the spine, but scoliosis progression seems to be due to rapid growth rather than a direct side effect of growth hormone. So once you start growth hormone, often there's this period of rapid catch-up growth, and then clearly there is rapid growth during puberty. Another side effect is reducing insulin sensitivity. So the body's cells become less responsive to insulin. That may lead to glucose intolerance or diabetes in an individual at risk. So somebody who doesn't have the risk factors, we don't see over diabetes. We don't necessarily screen for diabetes in every patient on growth hormone. And then a question that comes up um, that we don't tend to think about in most of our patients on growth hormone, but that's sleep apnea. And that's been brought up because of patients with Prader-Willi syndrome. Obstructive sleep apnea, so obstruction was when something's blocking the way, that can worsen after starting growth hormone therapy in some patients with Prader-Willi syndrome. And Prader-Willi syndrome does, is felt to have um, a lot of its dysfunction due to problems with the hypothalamus. So perhaps there's a relationship there with craniopharyngioma. But even there, the obstructive sleep apnea is an association. It's been seen. There's no proof that it causes. The mechanism is not clear. It's thought that maybe growth hormone causes enlargement of tonsils and adenoids. And in prader willi syndrome, patients do get sleep studies before starting growth hormone. That has not been the norm for patients with craniopharyngioma. And I'm not, and, and while there are lots of issues with sleep and somnolescence, um, in patients with craniopharyngiomas, the recommendations at this point have not been to do sleep studies on every patient who has a craniopharyngioma. So what about safety issues of growth hormone therapy in, in survivors of all brain tumors, not just craniopharyngiomas? So I hope many of you know this, but growth hormone its main action on growth is by production of insulin-like growth factor one. And insulin growth factor one from the liver circulates to the bone and insulin growth factor one in the bone, it's, it's produced there as well. And that causes bone growth. And it predominantly circulates attached to this IGF binding protein three. So what are the what happens? Growth hormone and neoplasia, neoplasia being uncontrolled abnormal growth of cells or tissues. Well, both growth hormone and insulin-like growth factors could favor tumor development because we know they promote cell proliferation, cell growth. 
They promote something called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition where cells gain both migratory and invasive properties, um, which are things that tumors like to do. They promote angiogenesis, which is formation of new blood vessels, and they inhibit apoptosis, which is death of cells. But on the other hand, those binding proteins that are also stimulated by growth hormone may actually protect against tumor progression. They inhibit mitogenesis cell division, which is really important, right? That's what's tumor, how tumors grow. And they stimulate the apoptosis or death of cells. And so it's sort of this, this yin yang plus minus thing. So what about um, sort of tumor recurrence in patients who are treated with growth hormone. And so this was a meta-analysis that I'd actually participated in looking at studies that were out there at the time. And what I can show you here um, is that with multiple studies, there was really no evidence for increased tumor recurrence. And I think that is what was really the concern years ago when I started doing this, was growth hormone gonna make tumors recur? And decades ago, kids weren't given growth hormone because there was concerns about that tumor recurrence. And then everybody got more cautious, cautiously started treat, treating, but were waiting several years and sort of snuck that earlier and earlier treatment. But at least to date, there's really no evidence for increased tumor recurrence. One of the occurrences has been, well, what about tumor recurrence, but Second tumors, you know, if you have one cancer, you're gonna get another cancer. And again, craniopharyngiomas, when we talk about them are not considered a cancer, but there are other cancers that could be associated or occur. And so the childhood cancer survivors looks at adults, more than 20,000 adults who were treated for childhood cancers at more than five years before. It doesn't include craniopharyngiomas. In their studies, they initially reported about a threefold increase of secondary neoplasms, but the most common one was meningioma. And with longer follow-up, that decreased to twofold, and more recent data showed no significant association. And so it wasn't clear whether they were just seeing more earlier or what was going on. And multiple other studies have shown similar results that actually no significant association of secondary neoplasms after growth hormone therapy. So again, the same meta-analysis looking at multiple studies showing no evidence for increased secondary neoplasia. And what was probably happening in the childhood cancer survivor study were that patients had received radiation and radiation itself is a risk factor for the meningioma, which is what they were mostly seeing. And we know that meningiomas occur with higher radiation doses. They, really didn't see any difference in the time involved, but there was no association in this. This is the French childhood cancer survivor study with growth hormone. So again, multiple ways suggesting that you don't get secondary neoplasms. Now gliomas, which are always of concern that don't seem to have an association with radiation dose. In this study, the sample size was too small to investigate the risk of growth hormone therapy. And so keep in mind that rare events don't occur that often, and it may take years and years and years and multiple, 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 multiple patients to show that there are any significant differences. But again, to date, we don't think growth hormone causes an increase in secondary neoplasms. Well, what about craniopharyngiomas and recurrence? There are some theoretical concerns. So the theoretical concerns follow the logic that craniopharyngiomas have growth hormone receptors. Increased growth hormone receptor expression may be associated with tumor aggressiveness, shown in one study. And then if you add exogenous, so sort of external growth hormone to craniopharyngioma cells in a tissue culture dish, there's cell growth. But there are several studies of children and adults, case control studies with craniopharyngioma Pharyngioma, who show no increased risk of recurrence with growth hormone therapy versus without receiving growth hormone therapy. And that's even true in those patients who still have remnants of their craniopharyngioma, and it includes those who were treated with radiotherapy. And there are also observation studies of growth hormone treatment 
Um, so these are post-marketing studies where the growth hormone companies continued to do surveillance on patients who were receiving growth hormone, and they showed similar findings. So again, no evidence that growth hormone is causing craniopharyngioma recurrence. And so in general, and this is sort of Endocrine Society clinical practice guidelines and the Growth Hormone Research Society consensus, one in 2018, one in 2022, um, both of which I, I was fortunate to participate in, um, recommended growth hormone based on the safety and efficacy demonstrated in the population, suggested waiting until one year disease free following completion of therapy for a malignant disease, but if there's chronic stable disease and thus may not ever be disease free, particularly optic pathway tumors, and I don't know if anybody in the audience has or has a child with an optic pathway tumor because they can similarly have growth hormone deficiency due to the location, it was advised discussing the appropriateness and timing with their oncologist. Oops. And most recently with this Growth Hormone Research Society consensus, which was, pediatric and adult endocrinologists from around the world, um, Europe, South America, Asia, um, United States, North America, Canada, everywhere, uh, that in children with craniopharyngioma and radiologically stable disease, testing for growth hormone deficiency and start of growth hormone therapy as early as three months after treatment, although they still recommended wait 12 months for adults. Why do you wait a little bit? So if, if nobody's worried, why don't you start right away? The reason you don't start away is the body's still recuperating. And when there's illness, there's often inflammation and inflammation can cause growth hormone resistance. Um, you know, that's probably bod the body's um, mechanism to cure itself, right? You don't want to spend all your energy growing. Whoops. Um, I'm not sure what's gone on here with my slides, so I apologize here. Are you guys seeing my uh, presentation or? Yeah, we still see the slides. It just, I think, went to two. It's, it came, <laughs> took itself off of screen presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we'll just do it. We're, I'm near the end anyway. So, okay, so I want to give you a couple caveats, okay? Growth hormone resistant humans, Lerone syndrome, they have low rates of cancer. And so it's not clear, you know, if you're going a long time and you don't have growth hormone able to work, maybe that's protective. And growth hormone deficient mice are resistant to chemically induced mammary carcinogenesis, so trying to make breast cancer, but they're made susceptible when administered growth hormone. On the other hand, if you go by that logic, blocking the pathway should be a great cure, but Peptides, antibodies, and small molecules that inhibit the action of the growth hormone IGF-1 axis have not been proven effective in treating cancers. So it's really benefits versus risks here. And so the benefits of treatment are, are great, especially if you're talking about a child and trying to achieve adult height. The risks, on the other hand, are probably low. And so the risk benefit ratio there is very high. On the other hand, you might imagine somebody who's not growth hormone deficient and just short, this is not the patient population where any even small, small, small risk may outweigh small amounts of growth benefits. So I think that we all feel comfortable in using growth hormone in this day and age, or most of us do, some places more comfortable than others. But I think with for any individual, you sort of need to think it through. I think at the end of the day though, um, you just have to be prepared to, to sort of know these facts and be able to deal if there is a recurrence that you that you didn't cause it. And I think that's somehow sometimes difficult for people um, feeling like, well, if they didn't do it, would things have ended differently? Again, the data is really good right now that growth hormones should be safe, but again, individual decisions. So with that, I am happy to take questions. I think along there was one question about sort of that had come up about growth spurts and, and growing. And growth hormone 
will help you grow, but usually around the time of puberty, even if you give a lot of growth hormone, you won't get a growth spurt until you start adding sex steroids. So normally sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen, testosterone through its conversion to estrogen, increase growth hormone secretion. So we can increase growth hormone, we can give more, but there's some direct effects on the bones as well that are really necessary. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. We do have some questions. Great. I'll start going through them with you. And um, everybody, you know, don't be afraid to post your questions. We will work through them. So we're starting with Jacob. And Jacob asks, at what age um, will I get to stop taking growth hormone? And, um, and then if he stops taking growth hormone at a certain age, what medications would he take to replace it? So there are multiple time points in terms of stopping growth hormone. So one is to never really stop growth hormone because if you're very growth hormone deficient, I ended the slideshow because I thought it would be a little easier. Um, if you never really, if you always need growth hormone, then why ever stop it? And certainly somebody who's got multiple other pituitary hormone deficiencies, we know they're growth hormone deficient. If it's just growth hormone deficiency by itself, then we would want to retest and know that somebody's growth hormone deficient. The second answer is when growth is complete, because there's that time you're giving it for growth, and then there's the time for all the other metabolic reasons. And you could argue that, well, you could just try to do your diet a little bit differently, work out a little bit more, not worry too much if there's a little bit more fat versus muscle. If the bone, you know, if you start having problems with lipids, which can happen with growth hormone deficiency, take a statin like Lipitor. Um, if you have low bone density, you can always get bisphosphonates. Some people will stop growth hormone even earlier. They get to a height that they're happy about. You know, if somebody is 5'8 and they're perfectly happy and they don't need, even if they were destined to be six feet, that might be fine for them. So it is a little bit of a personal decision, but typically, at least for childhood growth hormone deficiency, people wait until growth is near completion, which is less than two centimeters or four fifths of an inch a year. The other hormones um, clearly still need to be replaced. The thyroid hormone, um, the cortisol, the hydrocortisone usually, sometimes some of the other glucocorticoids there, and then the sex steroids, whether that's giving estrogen and progesterone if you're female or testosterone if you're male. So adults may opt or may decide to continue on a maintenance dose after growth is completed. Yeah, so it's a lower yeah. dose. So you need, yeah. you need less and less growth hormone as you get older. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. And um, someone asked, uh, I think you addressed this, but, but just to kind of revisit, my child does not produce eight, uh, GH, but still grows. Um, should she still take, um, or should the child still take a low dose, um, a recommended dose, or does the child not need it at all? So um, it depends on what you're trying to use it for. So certainly, the growth with gout growth hormone, which we really don't understand. There's been lots of speculation over the years as to why, but people really don't understand it. You're growing well, you don't need the growth hormone for height. Um, you probably need it for all those other metabolic reasons. Some people, when they get onto the growth hormone, their strength improves. They notice a little bit less, uh, again, sort of the, the fat, some, increased strength and things like that, but not always. And especially when you're wrestling with things like hypothalamic obesity, because it's not gonna cure the hypothalamic obesity. Um, and then it's sort of a risk benefit thing. You know, when I'm replacing growth hormone, I tend to like to use the lowest dose as possible anyway. I don't, um, there's a wide range of weight-based dosing and you have to be really careful, especially in patients um, who are significantly overweight that you're not doing it just based on weight. And so there are other ways you can calculate it by ideal body weight, you can calculate it by body surface area, but really it's the dose that's get that works. And for everybody, that's gonna be a little bit different. And so you can argue that low dose growth hormone is appropriate in kids who are profoundly growth hormone deficient anyway. Great, thank you. Um, and you touch on this, but um, getting more specific, <laughs> Um, cause you talk about the lean muscle mass, but, 
Um, the question was, does GH affect your BMI weight in a positive, positive way, i.e. losing weight, not gaining? So it doesn't cause you to lose weight per se. Um, in, I should say, so, so in sort of separating out, I'm going to try to separate out sort of the craniopharyngeal and hypoplamic obesity and sort of the more garden variety, just um, congenital growth hormone deficiency. Or even, pay, I should say, even patients who have growth hormone deficiency, say, due to radiation, who don't have all the other hypothalamic pituitary deficits. What you, what I, I've seen this many times. So when I stop growth hormone, the kids' weights do accelerate a bit, and they tend to, they just come in the next visit looking chubbier. And it's sort of said with when congenital growth hormone deficiency, people describe them as those cherubs in the old paintings. Um, they look like the, you know, they look very immature looking and they've, they've got sort of the belly and the body fat. And that does happen, but it's not, it's not like a weight loss drug, but it really can make a difference in terms of body composition. And it can be very obviously in somebody who's profoundly growth hormone deficient. And sometimes you don't know until you try it. And that's the other thing to remember when you're talking about medications, you can try something and stop or if you've decided not to start, you can decide to start later. Great point, thank you. Um, you talked a little, you talked about resistance. Um, someone asked if someone can be resistant to GH. Um, so uh, her child has been on growth hormone from 14 to 23 um, with only a slight bit of growth. So remember that, that it depends also how mature your bones are. So there's only so long you can grow until they stop growing. And, you know, in, in an average person without any underlying disorders who doesn't have any delays, a girl who's 14 or a boy who's 16 is at about 98% of their adult height. And so continuing to give growth hormone at that point isn't going to do any good. And we certainly don't want to delay um, giving the sex steroids. And those are what really mature and ultimately fuse the bones because they're incredibly important for bone density. Um, and what we don't want is to see 30 year olds who look like 80 year olds in terms of bone health. Great. So we did have the question about growth hormone um, causing tumor recurrence, which you so beautifully addressed. I think that is always the biggest question um, and topic that comes up. A lot, um, but the, uh, another question uh, the person posed was, um, is there anything else in addition to growth hormone? So we look to growth hormone in hopes that perhaps it will also give energy for some mm -hmm. of our um, survivors struggle with energy, they're sluggish. Um, are there any, I, they, she had said she kind of had thought that, um, that would have improved. Is there anything else in addition to that therapy that might help with energy? So, you know, there, it's, it's obviously very complicated. One is you want to make sure that the thyroid hormone level is adequate because that's going to contribute to fatigue. You want to try to mimic um, what the body normally would do with cortisol production. So the cortisol production is highest in the morning and it falls throughout the day. So what you don't necessarily need to be giving cortisol at bedtime, but you need a bigger dose in the morning and then lower doses throughout the day. And that can help as well. But, you know, the hypothalamus controls sleep and um, circadian rhythms and there, you know, there are several, many patients who have almost like a narcolepsy um, who are just fall asleep during the day. And nobody's adequately figured that out. We know that there's also not melatonin made appropriately. Um, sometimes giving melatonin at bedtime can help for those reasons, but it's, it's very, very difficult. And then finally, that the kid, people just don't move around as much. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Right? So think about if you exercise, you actually start, you get less tired, not more tired. And, and you know, if you can't move around, if you've got neurologic deficits, if you're 
partially blind, all of these things play a role in the fatigue, but it can be very difficult. I know that a lot of the patients are more fatigued than their peers. Sometimes some of the stimulant medications help as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, thank you. So the next question is, if the mechanism of action for GH is through IGF-1, would a normal or elevated IGF-1 contraindicate GH treatment, even with demonstrated GH defi deficiency, i.e. through an insulin tolerance test? So, all right, I'm gonna head to this a little bit. So in general, almost always, if the IGF-1 level is normal or elevated, you don't have growth hormone deficiency. Now you can fail growth hormone, te growth hormone testing is imperfect. So it's easy to fail growth hormone testing. And so there's a little bit of a chicken and egg who should be growth hormone deficient or not. Now, there are occasionally patients, it's mostly with hypothalamic gliomas who do have an elevated IGF-1 level who are probably growth hormone deficient. It gets a little tricky to then um, monitor them because we really would like to keep IGF-1 levels more around median mean, certainly not more than the upper limit of normal. And if it's already elevated, you don't really know how to monitor it for safety. But the growth hormone stimulation testing aren't perfect. If a patient has multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies, like three or more, they're just missing everything, or you know the surgeons cut the stock, then you know they're growth hormone deficient. And then who knows what's going on with that IGF-1 level. Thank you. Um, Rachel has a question. Um, so she has an 18 month old with a craniopharyngioma, likely GH deficient, but growth has remained steady. And she asked, when does growth hormone tend to be in the teak over as the primary hormone responsible for growth um, from the thyroid? Yeah, that's a great question. It's usually about six months actually. So nutrition and thyroid hormone are much more important in the first six months of life. Now growth hormone deficiency, in, you know, in again, idiopathic growth hormone deficiency, sometimes, you know, it, it'll start presenting after about six months and sometimes it doesn't present till about age two or three or so. Um, people who are profoundly growth hormone deficient, it does tend to um, show up earlier. But, you know, there may be other factors involved here that are continuing to have um, the child grow. And, and then also just determining growth in this age group is a little bit difficult. So one of the things you, you need to keep in mind is where should they be genetically? So they can sort of, if they're hovering along, say the same 10th percentile and growing, but the parents are both 95th percentile, well, by age one or two, they should have caught up to that, you know, 70, 90th percentile. And so that's growing normally wasn't really growing normally. So again, it's looking at the big picture and whenever we look at, at, at our patients, it's looking at their growth patterns, it's looking at genetics and all that. Great, thank you. We have um, some questions I'm gonna kind of combine about the frequency of, um, of taking growth hormones. So we have heard about the weekly shot um, love your thoughts on that. Um, and also a question about, is it required that growth hormone be taken every day? Um, is that necessary? And, um, and, and asked again, any hope for a solution that doesn't require a daily injection. So thoughts about the weekly shot and then thoughts about if, um, it really is necessary every single day. Okay. So let's, we'll, we'll sort of tackle the every single day first. So growth hormone secreted impulses mostly overnight. And so when you're giving it nightly, you're trying to at least mimic the fact that you make growth hormone every single day. We do know that giving the same weekly dose six times a week is as effective as seven times a week. I think many of us prescribe seven times a week, just psychologically, it makes a little bit more sense. And then you're always remembering to take it. But I've certainly given patients who, who struggle with that a holiday day. Um, and sometimes it can be a good negotiator with kids. Okay, you know, which is gonna be your, your growth hormone free day. We know that taking that same dose less than three times a week did not work as well. So you really do wanna take it at least six times per week. Now, long acting growth hormone is here. The problem is long acting growth hormone is different from nightly growth hormone. So when you give nightly growth hormone, you're giving a dose of growth hormone and then it comes down. And so your IGF-1 levels stay 
pretty stable during that time. Growth hormone has some in effects that are independent from IGF-1. When you give long-acting growth hormone, you're going to have higher doses of growth hormone around for a while. We don't really know what that does. And the IGF-1 levels are high soon after the shot, low before the next shot, and sort of at that middle range in the middle of the week. And so we don't really know what that means long-term. In the short term, the safety profile looks really good. But I can tell you the Growth Hormone Research Society is still concerned and we're really I think people all over the world wanted to see more formal studies done by the growth hormone companies in cancer survivors before really saying that it makes no difference. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Susan. She asks, as your child gets older, do you need to balance estrogen and GH? So, um, so just puberty in general, growth hormone secretion does go up during puberty um, and it probably doubles, although that doesn't mean you necessarily need to double the dose of growth hormone because it's just different when you're giving it. Um, when you start giving estrogen, in part, it depends on how you're giving it. So um, oral estrogens, patients who are on oral estrogens need higher doses of growth hormone than patients who are on transdermal estrogens. And in general, women need higher doses of growth hormone than men. So yes, there is a, this interplay with estrogen. I'm not sure if that answers the question that was being asked. So, yeah. um, okay, so here's kind of a touchy subject is, and we talked about this every, every sort of place where the treat might have a different policy on how long to wait uh, to start growth hormone. So Erica asks, my nine-year-old has not grown in 14 months since craniopharyngioma resection. Her endocrinologist wants to wait at least two years for GH for fear of regrowth. Is there a risk to waiting this long? Um, and what are your thoughts there? My thoughts is that I think she can I think again, it's just it has to do with education and um, comfort level, right? So people who see more of it might be more comfortable with starting. And you know, it all goes back to the old let's wait two years to make sure things don't recur. Um, I can't tell you that it's not going to recur while you're on growth hormone therapy. And if you start growth hormone therapy tomorrow and it recurs because craniopharyngiomas happen to recur, uh, you just have to recognize that it really probably wasn't the growth hormone, but so if, you know, if it's, if it's your child and that happens, it's difficult to tell yourself that. Um, second opinions are always good, you know, or saying, you know, I went to this conference and there's, can, can you look up, there's this growth hormone research society consensus statement that just came out, um, you know, those, those kinds of things. But, you know, I certainly second opinions can be helpful as well. Do you feel like it's appropriate I've asked this question before, and I always just think it's interesting to ask, but do you feel like it's appropriate to print out that report and take it with you to an appointment and, and you know, hand it to, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Out of curiosity. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always, um, I, I always have mixed feeling, you know, so I love learning from my patients. And I, so for some of my patients who have very um, unusual diseases that I don't know much about uh, and, and are part of support groups, I actually learn from them. And as long as they feel comfortable with the fact that they may be teaching me something, I like that. Um, and as long as somebody doesn't throw it in my face and say, you don't know what you're talking about or, or whatever. So I think those sorts of things can be very, very helpful. Again, it depends on the person. Um, but what you also need to do is recognize that every physician has their comfort level. And so if you come in and Dr. X says they do something this way and your doctor doesn't believe it, I mean, my, what I usually tell people, look, I don't wanna do this, why I don't wanna do it. And really, if you wanna go with that, you should continue to go see Dr. X. And sometimes I'll listen to, you know, I. A lot of us, Pete's endocrine in particular is such a small field that I feel like we know everybody, people, post on various listservs, ask questions. The long acting growth hormone question just came up. Um, you know, I think it's a pretty 
good field. I wouldn't bring anything really extreme out there, but if it's some major consensus statement or whatever, I think you probably could bring it. Not to put you on the spot or anything, but thank you for your input there. I think it was a, this, um, <laughs> comment that just came up I like too, and I'm very curious to see what that said. Um, as someone asked about heart health, um, so is if um, you don't replace growth hormone and you are deficient, are you risking your heart health? So um, the studies, there's studies all over the place, whether growth hormone improves cardiac function or doesn't improve. Um, there are also studies that suggest that growth hormone deficient individuals have some increase in inflammatory markers and increases in cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Certainly cholesterol you can take care of in other ways. So possibly, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a little bit less clear as some of the other things like the fat mass, muscle mass. Okay. And this person mentions um, that they, uh, they are severely sensitive to, and have had the issues with high blood sugar. And I think it, you termed, it was called Skiffy. Is that the, how you Skiffy. use the acronym? Yeah. Um, so this is a question um, that we feel um, here at the Raymond A. Wood Foundation for our adult patients is um, how can one find an adult endocrinologist as knowledgeable as you? Um, and I feel like my endocrinology care was better as a pediatric patient. Um, and I know you, you're so involved in, in the landscape of endocrinology um, associations and groups. So, you know, any, any tips there? Yeah. So I think that, you know, the adult growth hormone deficiency replacement is, um, it's newer. So that's one thing. Um, as any of you who have children in growth hormone know, the prior authorization process is a bear. So I think there are many adult endocrinologists who just don't want to deal with it. Um, and so just really haven't learned about it, don't feel like the importance. Um, I think this is somewhere where if you're near a major medical center and there are people who deal with growth hormone, uh, who have growth expertise in growth hormone, that probably trumps even expertise in cancer survivorship. Certainly if you're at centers that take care of adults who have pituitary adenomas, they have many of the same issues. Uh, but I think that when you get into the adult world, there's also a lot more sort of local endocrinologists as well. But you know, that's where if you're closer to a major medical center, that may help. And we have covered the topic of transitioning and continue to cover that topic um, because we do hear a lot that the transition is a little challenging to getting from peds to adult. And um, so we have we do work and address that in our conferences a lot. Um, I have uh, just a comment. Susan says, Dr. Cohen, thank you for everything. We miss you at Children's in Boston. <laughs> I miss everybody, <laughs> my patients and my <laughs> colleagues in Boston as well, although I'm enjoying New York. Very good. And um, I, th I think we pretty much tackled everything in a timely manner. So that's um, wonderful. I, I think we've got everyone's question. Do you have any final comments that you want to share? Uh, you know, I would, I would just share, be an advocate for your child. Um, recognize that, that unfortunately we don't have all the answers, especially when it comes to craniopharyngioma. Um, and maybe someday we'll have more answers and certainly lots of people are, are, are uh, thinking about it. We don't completely understand all the hypothalamic dysfunction. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I think, you know, all of us collectively from our perspective as a patient advocacy organization, we're really working to kind of better create research around better understanding that so that these ongoing going challenges with a hypothalamic obesity and so forth, you know, we can get some more clarity around hopefully in the future. Um, so thank you, Dr. Cohen, so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and your expertise and answering these questions. Um, I did want to add one little thing that I do see come up quite a bit is, and you, you touched on it, was the prior authorization. And I know people get really discouraged, especially when, you know, it's your first 
it's your first time um, getting that, getting growth hormone and you get the denial. And um, a lot of times that's just how the process works. It's a little bit of a game. We go through it. I've been seven years into this and we go through it every six months. <laughs> so um, don't be discouraged. That's kind of how it works, but they usually eventually come through with an approval. So it's just kind of the back and forth, unfortunately. Um, so let me just, uh, we have one announcement. Hopefully we can get my screen up. Um, so we do have two more sessions scheduled uh, in our monthly learning series, which happens over the spring. So we have the review of study findings from intranasal oxytocin and hypothalamic obesity, which uh, will be presented by Dr. Shana McCormack of CHOP on May 18th. And then June 14th, we'll be, um, we'll be discussing steroid replacement and adrenal insufficiency with Dr. Topor from Hasbro Children's Hospital. So if you are interested in attending these webinars, um, just go to the Raymond A. Wood Foundation website, click on events, and you can register there. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to Jamie Ping, who is our new outreach coordinator, who you've probably started hearing from. Um, she will be working with the patient community and um, managing these webinars coming up. And thanks again to Dr. Cohen and everyone who attended tonight. And we will be sending out a recording within the next couple of days. So thank you all so much and have a good evening.